It's 12 o'clock, and I want to welcome everybody to our Woodland Wildlife um, Wednesday series of webinars. Um, my name is uh, Jonathan Kays. I'm an Extension uh, Forester with the University of Maryland Extension, and Andrew Kling, who is an educator as well with the University of Maryland Extension. And uh, we've started a series of Woodland uh, Wildlife webinars on the last uh, Wednesday of the month. And we'll be having others as well. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. By joining us for this webinar, you will be registered for notifications of future webinars and other events from the Woodland Stewardship Education Program, as well as our free quarterly newsletter called Branching Out. If you don't want to receive the newsletter or notifications of future events, we ask you to please email Pam Thomas at pthomas at umd.edu and in that message say no events. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our website and our YouTube channel. Our website is www.extension.umd.edu slash woodland. At this point, um, I want to introduce uh, Harry Spiker and uh, let him get on with his um, uh, with his with his presentation. If you have questions, uh, I want you to put those questions into the chat box, and um, we'll be dealing with most of those really just at at the end. So um, we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, so please uh, ask away, and um, we can go from there. So uh, Harry, if you would you want to share your screen, I think we can see you now. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, uh, and thanks to everybody tuning in. A um, little bit of a rocky start here, and this is my, my first attempt at doing this presentation uh, not in front of a live audience, so uh, we'll, we'll learn together as, as we go. But uh, please, uh, if we run out of time, you have questions, uh, my contact information will be at the end, and, and feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I've been, uh, I guess, a little bit of background on me. I've been uh, working for the Department of Natural Resources here since 1996, so I've been here a while. Uh, I took over as the principal bear biologist in 2001. Um, so uh, I've gotten to see the landscape change and uh, follow this, what I still consider to be an amazing critter uh, you know, along this journey. Uh, you know, here in Western Maryland. So uh, with uh, with that, I'll get going with the slides. And I like for this to be, uh, I guess, a little, uh, give a little bit of a historical perspective uh, to our population because uh, I do think, uh, I guess, while it's not unique in Maryland, you know, many states have seen this change. Uh, it, it really is um, a pretty magnificent uh, journey that the bears have taken on the landscape. At the time of European settlement, uh, black bears uh, occupied all of Maryland, I mean, everywhere from the eastern shore to the mountains of western Maryland. Um, as settlers moved westward, of course, um, you know, they needed to clear the landscape for agriculture, the charcoal industry, the shipbuilding industry. I mean, uh, the timber was the number one natural resource of the day, and uh, unfortunately, you know, that, that led to a serious habitat decline, uh, not only for black bears, but other critters as well. You know, white-tailed deer, wild turkeys, numerous songbirds. Uh, a lot of wildlife suffered, um, you know, from the clearing of the landscape. Luckily for us, uh, Mother Nature is resilient. Um, you know, the, the, the numbers dwindled uh, until by the 1950s, there were really only a few uh, bears left in the state. Uh, and they were confined to the to the steep slopes of western Maryland, pretty much. Uh, you know, the bulk of them at that time would have been on the Garrett Allegheny County line, where you've got steep slopes without big enough waterways at the bottom to float timber out. Um, but of course, you know, the habitat recovered. Uh, you know, we now have a, a mature forest that is just, you know, really, uh, you know by all, all standards, a, a pretty healthy forest here in Maryland, and uh, the wildlife has has improved, and uh, you know, the populations have rebounded, um, so black bears included. Uh, 
Yeah. So uh, Maryland's occupied bear range is really the four western counties, if you look at that map on the screen. Uh, Garrett, Allegheny, Washington, and Frederick counties uh, are what we consider occupied bear range. And um, our definition of occupied bear range is where we know that there are females giving birth uh, to cubs. Um, they require the, the smallest home range, if you will, and we know if there's sows giving birth to cubs, um, that, 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 that that area is being used year round. And uh, right now we've got you know, evidence of the four western counties, although to be honest with you, I suspect that western Montgomery County um, is occupied now as well, but I cannot, uh, you know, I can't confirm that because we have not confirmed uh, a sow with cubs in western Montgomery. Um, so we share this population uh, with, other, with our other states surrounding us. It, it's really a, a regional population. Um, you know, we're here in the mid-Atlantic or the mid-Appalachian region, and the habitat here is just wonderful for bears. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more in, in, the, uh, within, in the next couple slides or so. Uh, but our, our, our population density is similar to those uh, states around us, to the populations that we have around us. Again, it's a regional population. Uh, females have, uh, they maintain about a 10 square mile home range. Here in Western Maryland, uh, males will have anywhere from a 25 to a 50 square mile range. So you can imagine with those large home ranges, you know, bears don't observe political borders, of course. So you know, our Maryland bears are also West Virginia bears, our Pennsylvania bears, and so on. Um, luckily, uh, I get to work with the, the bear biologists from our surrounding states pretty closely and, and biologists from throughout the northeastern United States and, and in Canada, um, you know, I work with pretty closely. So I've got a, a good grasp on what's going on um, in the regional population. And uh, if you look at this, um, you can see that this is information taken from bear biologists uh, for a survey done for the Eastern Black Bear Workshop. Um, and uh, you know, most states report an increasing bear population uh, you know, in the eastern United States uh, and Canada right now. I mean, really, as far as black bears go, uh, these are the good old days, uh, if you will. Um, you know, their populations are increasing um, not only... Uh, you know, some states like Maryland, you see the whole state is colored in, but we only have, you know, four counties that are occupied, but that is growing, that's increasing. So even the states that have bears, their their home ranges and, and their range is increasing within those uh, jurisdictions. Um, so black bears in general are doing really well, uh, particularly in this part of the country right now. Uh, I'll bring that down to scale a little bit with uh, what's going on some in, in Maryland. And I just want to put this on there because it's a key time right now. Uh, in the bear's annual life cycle, May and June are pretty important in that uh, you know, that's when juvenile dispersal happens. Uh, so when the juvenile dispersal um, you know, happens, what happens is, is uh, sows give birth to cubs every other year. So basically, they keep those cubs with them for a year and a half. Uh, you know, it's nearly a year and a half, and then they kick them out when they get ready to breed again. So May and June is when those basically teenage bears are getting kicked out, forced to find a territory of their own. Um, bears are territorial, uh, and uh, particularly male bears don't like to share their food resources with other male bears. And I can assign it. I can write comments. And Jim, okay, not I've, got, I've got somebody wearing... speaking on the microphone here. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, right now there are there's a lot of bear movement, and if you've been, if you, if you live in Montgomery County, uh, you know, in the eastern part of the county, there've been a couple of bears running around. Uh, Baltimore County recently, uh, potentially Harford County right now. We've got juvenile bears moving through all those areas. Um, but if you look at this map, 
Uh, I put recent bear sightings because just about every year we get sightings in these counties, except for those ones on the eastern shore. Uh, but I, I like including those because it lets you know that the bears are capable of showing up anywhere. Uh, bears have been known to disperse more than 100 miles. I remember we've got dispersing bears coming down from Pennsylvania, up from Virginia, uh, moving east out of western Maryland. Um, so, you know, in 2009, we had a bear show up on the eastern shore. Uh, as recently as last year, we had one, I guess, up in Cecil County. Um, so, they, you know, they, it's potential to see a bear anywhere in the state. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, you know, has a saying, he says, never say never when it comes to wildlife. And, and I, I believe that uh, wholeheartedly uh, surprising what you find when you look. Um, and you'll notice Carroll County, I kind of say this tongue in cheek, uh, Carroll County's not colored in and it's not because the, <clears throat> excuse me, the bears don't move through there, but I suspect the people just aren't calling DNR when they do. Um, so that's a little tongue in cheek there, but uh, yeah, I would include Carroll County in that as well. Uh, so with that little bit of history, uh, I'll move on with, uh, you know, a, a large part of my job uh, is overseeing the population monitoring of our bear population. Um, you know, so you know where they are in the state. Now we've got a, a lot of really talented staff that, that work with bears in this state. Um, so you know, by no means am I doing this. You know, this is a, uh, you know, a lot of people putting efforts into this. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that we do each year is our bear reproduction monitoring. Certainly one of the more enjoyable parts of the job, um, but it's where we track the population growth, uh, if you will. And uh, some, some basic statistics there, bears give birth from one to five cubs per litter typically. Um, five is pretty uncommon. Uh, our average litter size is three cubs per sow, and again, they give birth every other year. Uh, those reproductive rates here are typical of here in the Mid-Appalachian region, and uh, they really indicate excellent habitat. Uh, one thing you know that you'll know as you go to other parts of the country, as you go to the southeast, you know that drops down maybe to uh, two and a half cubs per sow. In areas out west, there will be areas where it's one and a half cubs per sow. And uh, in some areas, the bears may not even give birth every other year, but maybe they don't give birth till the, you know, uh, maybe they take two years in between, uh, you know, when the habitat is poorer. But in a lot of areas where bears depend on one species of, um, you know, tree perhaps, you know, to provide the bulk of their food, you know, some forest bears rely largely on beech crops, and if the beech don't do well, then they don't do well. Here in the Mid-Appalachian region, part of what makes it so hardy here is, is the multitude of species that we have providing food for these critters. If the acorns don't produce, which is the, the bear's single most important food in this region, um, but if the acorns don't produce, then they've got the cherries, the hickories, and numerous uh, you know, shrub component, uh, you know, species producing foods uh, that, that they, can, they can use that, um, you know, the energy from those foods and still manage to do well. Um, you know, that, that explains the high reproductive rates here in the Mid-Appalachian region. Uh, a little bit of background on, on these pictures. Uh, the picture on the right uh, is our crew and, a, and the two ladies that you see to the far right are two veterinarians. Oh, my, uh, when we do this in the field, uh, you know, when we do this work, um, the uh, Maryland Zoo in Baltimore has has been a big partner throughout this, and uh, they usually have a veterinarian present, and uh, then we have our DNR veterinarian uh, present as well, and uh, basically, you know, we're monitoring not just the 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 number of cubs that are being born, but Really, these, these bears become kind of indicators for the health of the bear population. Um, so we've done a lot of research with these folks as well. Uh, we did a Ciro survey uh, uh, a few years back with, uh, with the Baltimore Zoo that you know, had some interesting, uh, showed some interesting results 
on uh, different diseases that bears have been exposed to in the wild, things like that. Um, if you look at that picture on the left, uh, that bear, uh, that's a den from this year, and that bear was actually extracted from under that deck that you see in the background. Um, so you know, they don't require a big space by any means, uh, and that bear gave birth to three cubs in there. Um, I mentioned that they, they may give birth anywhere from one to five cubs, and uh, we have only twice worked a radio collared sow with five cubs, uh, and one of those, and we've been doing this since the mid 1980s, uh, you know, here at DNR. And uh, one of those times was this year, actually, in Garrett County. Uh, we had a sow with five cubs uh, that gave birth under a deck similar to the one that you see in that picture right there. Um, you know, and then uh, the other one was in 2015 in Green Ridge State Forest in Allegheny County. Uh, so you, you know, you've got two spectrums. The, the one under the deck was clearly a bear that's used to being around people, uh, potentially some uh, auxiliary feeding there, if you will. Uh, and then uh, the other case was a bear that was clearly a forest bear, you know, very little contact with people. Um, so, you know, absolutely good habitat, good production. So when we have the cubs in hand, uh, we weigh them, uh, we determine the sex. The sex ratio almost always breaks out to be one-to-one. -one. Uh, if you look at the long-term data set, uh, it's, it's a one-to-one -one sex ratio. Uh, we will tag the cubs, um, and then, uh, again, the, the sow gets monitored for her health. Uh, we do uh, a lot of work there, and then we put a new either VHF radio or GPS transmitter on the sow. Uh, depending on what we're using at the time. And, uh, thanks, Ryan. <laughs> um, so a little background, background on the dens. Uh, here we go. Um, the den that you see in this picture um, is actually the most typical den site that we find here in Western Maryland. It's simply a brush pile. We'll, we'll get either a blowdown that's blown down or uh, just a, a brush pile of debris, and that is where we end up finding most of our radio collared sows. Um, this this was a Garrett County sow that actually had four cubs. It's tough to see the fourth, one, two, three, four, um, but she was a very healthy sow, uh, over 300 pounds when we pulled her out of the den, and uh, you know the average sow ends up at around 200 pounds, and males can get much bigger. Um, so sows rarely get bigger than 300 pounds. So th this was a really remarkable bear. Had uh, collared in Garrett County for for a long time. Um, one thing I guess I, I, I could point out there is that uh, I, I see a question there that, that came in. I'll answer most of them later, but this one's pertinent now. Can we tell the age of the sows? Yes, we actually take a, a very small premolar tooth out of the sow from right behind the canine, the tooth is only the size of a match head. Um, but we'll take that out, send it to a lab, and they will cross-section it, stain it, and basically count rings just like you would a tree to tell the age. Um, the science in that is advanced enough now that uh, the lab can tell us at what ages the sows gave birth, uh, you know, just like it, just like uh, in a drought event, a tree ring does not add on a, as much growth in a year. Same thing when when the sows give birth, because they're lactating, uh, you know the, the the rings and the teeth don't get as large. Um, and one of the other things that indicates a good habitat around here is that the bulk of our sows are giving birth for the first time at the age of three. Um, some not till four. But if you go to other regions of the country, they may not give birth until the age of five. And again, that's, that's strictly habitat um, and that, that they're doing really well here. Um, so back, back to this other, uh, th this next picture, um, that's a bear that basically it's an open den and we see that quite a bit. Um, if you look around, it's all multiflora rose. So she's actually got a pretty well protected place and we tend to find that when bears do this, they tend to be on the southern or the southeastern slopes where they get a lot of sunshine to soak into that black pelt and really warm them up and, and keep them comfortable. Um, 
We also have bears denning in trees. Uh, the one I mentioned from Green Ridge State Forest that gave birth to five cubs back in 2015, she was actually 12 feet above the ground in an oak tree. Um, this one is a large ash tree in Frederick County. And if you look at where my head is um, on the ladder there, uh, basically straight in from my head, there is a three-year-old sow that gave birth to her first litter of three cubs um, that climbed up. And what happened is as the wind would blow those large trunks where they split, it formed a cavity in there. And she was able to actually climb up, climb down, and into that cavity and give birth to the cubs. Um, so it's really remarkable in how, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, how many different types of habitat they can use and in what ways. And I will tell you that if you go to the southeastern part of the country, uh, denning in trees is much more common than up here uh, in our area. And the ecological benefit there, of course, is to protect the cubs from getting drowned out during flood events. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of swamp type area area like that. You'll find bears denning in trees at a uh, higher frequency there. And of course, we have uh, the, the you know what everybody pictures a bear den as you know this one rock den in the upper left. Um, that is a Garrett County bear that, that uh, had three cubs in, in that rock den with her. And I will tell you, it's, it's true. If they can get their head in, they can get their body in. Um, and typically, the rock dens that we find are not large holes or crevices at all. Uh, and if you think about it, it, takes, you know, it, it heats up better for them, maintains a better temperature if it's a small space. Uh, and then if you're astute, you will notice the picture in the lower right corner uh, are two yearling bears. So they were born the previous year, uh, and they are under a deck. So the sow and 300-pound yearlings were all, were all under the deck of this homeowner's home, uh, and he did not know it until we showed up with our telemetry gear and uh, let the homeowner know, you know, you've got four bears under your deck. And uh, at which case he insisted that we get them out of there, which we did. And as you see here, the sow and one, one yearling are already out. And uh, then we extracted these two a short while afterwards um, and moved them to a, to a spot very, very nearby uh, where it was still within their home range. And, uh, so we know how many are, uh, we know how many bears are being born. Uh, we also track mortality in the state. And if you look, uh, the number one source of mortality, of course, is road kills. Um, bears and roads have a tough time. And if you think about it, as a driver driving down the highway, the bulk of our, of our road kills come on Interstate 68 and Interstate 70. And if you think about it, you know, most of the bears that get hit are yearling size, so you know, anywhere from 85 to 150 pounds. Uh, and think about that, you know, so it's the same size as a deer, but a completely black animal. And most of them hit at night. You can certainly understand how they get hit. Um, we have worked with State Highway Administration to put signage up on the highways in known hot spots. And, uh, and I can tell you all this, that the known hot spots basically bears are ridge runners. Um, they like to travel ridge tops, and of course here our, our ridges run northeast to southwest, and the interstate runs east-west. So where the interstate is crossing those ridge tops, essentially, you know, through Garrett, Allegheny, Washington, and Frederick counties, essentially is going to be a hot spot, um, you know, for bears to travel. And at certain times of the year, the peak the peak times are now uh, during the uh, the peak times are now during the uh, dispersal period when there's a lot of juveniles moving. And then again in October, November, when bears are really fattening up for winter. Um, and somebody asked about the spikes on this graph, and that, that's a really good question. Uh, yes, it, we can correlate the spikes on this graph uh, to when there are natural food shortages. Uh, again, October, November is a peak time. 
uh, for road kills, and that is the time when bears are really working to put on calories and, and put on pounds for the winter. Um, and so if there is an abundant supply of natural foods, they don't have to move as far to feed. And if there's a scarce uh, acorn supply, for example, then they've got to they basically have to cover more ground, which makes them more susceptible to being hit on the roads. Um, so yes, those spikes do correlate with years of natural food shortages. All right, um, so we also have a scent station survey that we run, and this is pro probably our best long-term trend tool that we have for monitoring the population. We've been doing this since 1993. Um, it's really technical stuff. Basically, we hang sardines in trees. Uh, we, we'll hang the sardines in trees, and then we'll come back uh, just a little over a week later, and we'll see how many of them were visited by bears. Um, you know, how many of them you know, did a bear attempt to take the sardines away? And we've, uh, you know, we've been doing this across all four counties for the past several years. We started this survey in 1993, and because we're running the same routes uh, over and over again, and uh, you know, really the same time of year, you know, it gives us a real good trend tool as far as the population goes. And if you look since 1993 through 2018, our most recent year of data, um, you can see the population is definitely increasing. Um, that also plays into the number of road kills, of course. You'll notice they went up uh, as time progressed. Uh, somebody asked about trail cameras. Uh, we do sometimes at some of the uh, at some of the locations use trail cameras, but typically no. Uh, most of the stations we do not. But what we do is we put the uh, sardines out of reach, where the only things that'll get them really are raccoons, possums, and bears. Um, so we use heavy heavy cord that a possum or raccoon has a tough time uh, getting to, and hang them. Try to hang the sardines, you know, at least three feet away from the trunk of the tree, uh, so that you know the bear's got to work for it, and a, and a raccoon and a possum has a tougher time getting it. Um, so this is really, you know, it, it's a simple tool, but it's a wonderful tool. Uh, here's uh, some pictures of some of the evidence that we find. Uh, you know, there we had a trail camera on that one, of course. You can see the claw marks where it climbed the uh, tree in the upper right. Uh, and then we usually find um, sardine cans close by that look like they were shot with a 38 caliber handgun, uh, you know, from the, the canine tooth of, of the bear, you know, biting right through it. Um, and if you look at this, um, this next chart here, our graph, we're showing basically um, the portion to the left shows prior to Maryland's bear hunt. If any of you have followed Maryland's bear management over time, you know, we implemented a bear hunting season uh, in 2004. And so here we have a similar number of years before and after the bear hunt. Our, our goal with the bear hunt um, is to, uh, was to slow the growth of the population and allow the bear population to continue to grow but at a slower rate. And if you look at this uh, graph here, you know, it's exactly what it's charting out, um, you know, what, what it's following along at. So uh, I think we're doing pretty good. And I continue to use this kind of as a check on the bear hunt, um, you know, to make sure that, that we don't, we don't want to over harvest the bears. We um, want to try and keep a healthy population out there. So that'll bring us to the next uh, round and that is, um, you know, basically a big part of the job is uh, monitoring the population, uh, managing for the population, and then the other part is managing uh, for conflict, human-bear conflict. Excuse me. Um, so we also track um, nuisance calls. We get several nuisance calls each year. And, uh, you know, we've been running, you know, four to 500 calls typically for the last few years. Um, now, the nuisance calls are not, not as good at estimating, at using as a population estimator, estimator excuse me, um, because what happens is people, the more people are exposed to bears, 
the more tolerant they become. So cultural carrying capacity, how many bears will the public allow on the landscape? It's always shifting, um, which is a good thing. And, uh, and again, we find that, uh, you know, right now, you know, typically our core population has been Garrett and Allegheny County. Uh, but in recent years, there's been a lot of growth in Washington and Frederick counties. Uh, and we find that, you know, Washington and Frederick County people, you know, they're, they're more tolerant now than they were eight or ten years ago to having bears, you know, right there in their backyards. Um, so we get less nuisance when a bear travels through and uh, tears down a bird feeder. Now people know, take the feeder in. They don't call us anymore you know, for that. Um, so this is good information for us to track. Um, it's certainly, we certainly want to know what's going on uh, as far as conflict out there. Um, so we will continue to, you know, to collect this information and respond to these issues as necessary. So nuisance complaints, we, we break them down by, uh, you know, and you know, a few years ago, uh, this bird feeder column or category over here on the lower left that's 10 percent now that used to be at 30 couple percent it used to be that trash and bird feeders were the two biggest calls because um, they are the two most popular attractants but again now people in bear country know if a bear gets your bird feeder take the bird feeder in um, you know, just stop feeding the birds and the problem goes away uh, I guess while I'm talking about that, I'll note that you know bears have wonderful long-term memory. If they get a meal that they like, they will return more than likely, unless unless it's one of those bear that's that's just dispersing through an area. It's likely going to come back and try to get another meal. Um, so they're really intelligent and uh, great long-term uh, memories. Um, but if you look at this, um, hit by the car, again, you know, that's, that's one that uh, we kind of struggle with from a management perspective. Um, you know, we can put signs up, we can put news releases out, um, but it, it's you know, a little bit tough to, get a, to, to do a lot more than that. Um, but looking at some of the, a couple of things I'd like to point out is you'll notice pets, poultry, livestock, and bees, 14%. And I want to uh, just draw a little attention to that and point out that that is a category that is inflated um, because when we get a phone call, that phone call gets logged. And if we get a phone call about a bear attacking, say, a horse, it gets logged as a livestock um, issue. But then we go out and we do a field investigation and the bulk of those calls um, are not you know, are not you know, validated, if you will. Um, so I know that those are, uh, are overinflated. Um, you know, bears have attacked horses. Um, but it's pretty darn uncommon. It doesn't make a lot of um, sense for a 200 pound bear to go after an 800 pound horse. Uh, you know, it's not typically the way they go. Bear, and bears typically um, eat much more in the way of uh, vegetable matter than animal matter, although they are opportunistic. Um, backyard chickens, um, they certainly will take if they get a chance. So electric fence is wonderful. Um, somebody asked about bees as an attractant, and yes, uh, bees can be a big attractant for bears, um, but properly installed and maintained electric fencing is a super thing. Um, you know. It, Bears and electric fences do not get along. And uh, we've got some information on our website on how to, how to construct such a fence. And, uh, and I can add, when it comes to bears, um, we recommend actually baiting the fence. And what we'll do is put a, put a strip of aluminum foil over one of the wires with, uh, and hold it together with peanut butter. Um, and what that does is that draws the bear's nose to the foil, and this is tough love. Uh, if you know anything about livestock and electric fences, um, basically whenever an animal is shocked and it's shocked behind the eyes, it runs forward. So if that bear is able to get his, heads through, his head through the wires before it gets shocked, he's likely going to run forward, tear the fence down, end up getting the beehives anyway. 
Um, the larvae in the beehives are even more attractive than any honey that would be in there. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of reward there for that bear. So you want to have the wires close enough to, that he can't get his head through and also bait that thing so he gets zapped on the nose. If he gets zapped in front of the eyes, then they retreat and go backwards. So like that, and I need to speed up a little bit here. Um, but the other one that I will point out, home and building entry, um, we actually get about 10 of those a year now. Uh, and some of them are actually bears getting in through sliding glass windows. But a portion of that category is also a bear entered an attached garage when the garage door was up and, uh, and got into the trash. Um, you know, that's the, the bigger quantity, but we do get a few of those. So um, if you're you know, in bear country, you know, watch, watch the uh, attractants. Again, trash and bird feeders are the biggest two. Um, if you feed pets or livestock outside, just give them enough food uh, for a meal at, at a time so that there's not a lot, left o a lot left over. That'll also minimize the number of raccoons, possums, foxes, and other critters um, you know, coming in as well. Again, trash uh, accounts for a large, uh, you know, the biggest quantity of nuisance calls. Um, we have found some really good solutions. Community trash compactors are great. We've had some vacation communities in, in uh, Garrett County that had bear problems, um, you know, repeated bear problems year after year. And so they, they actually put trash compactors in and that stopped the problems cold. Um, so, you know, I really recommend those. Um, there are ways to bear proof trash receptacles and dumpsters. Home Depot even sells a bear proof trash can like the one on the lower right, um, you know, that a bear can't work the latch. Uh, you know, you can, uh, uh, but another, Really important thing is just keep your keep your trash in a building uh, until the morning of pickup. Don't put it out the night before, um, and, and then that usually is good enough. Bird feeders, another big attractant. Um, so uh, again, there's no need to feed birds, um, but you know what what you may want to do is just feed them during the winter when most of the bears are denned. Not all of the bears in this area actually hibernate, but uh, most of them, most of them do. Uh, and so, you know, that's one thing you can do. Uh, and then what I tell people is if a bear hits it, just take it in because they will, they will check back. Um, and, you know, when we do have problems with bears, it's when they get used to getting food from people. Yeah, I, I saw a comment quickly about trash companies. I will tell you, trash companies have been the toughest ones to work with at times, uh, but if you get enough of your neighbors together, you know they're depending on you for for their uh, payments. So sometimes it takes getting getting some of your neighbors together uh, and you know, telling the trash company that you've got a problem because the trash companies also don't like picking up uh, you know trash that that's been scattered throughout out the yard by bears. Um, so this next segment is going to be uh, about bear biology and behavior, um, different types of behaviors. Uh, we have uh, density-driven behaviors, uh, in which bears are territorial. I mentioned that. Um, you know, females, again, a home range of about 10 square miles. Males, about 25 to 50 square miles. And uh, males and females are both forgiving of other females in their range. Um, Young males have the largest home ranges. Again, the older males, they don't want to share, they don't want to share their food resources and they don't want to share their females with those younger males. So those young males have it tough. They basically keep getting their butts kicked from one spot to another. So they will have the largest home ranges and therefore they're oftentimes the ones that are coming in contact with people. Um, we have seasonal bear activities uh, in the spring. Uh, bears emerge from their den typically in March and April. Uh, again, uh, juvenile dispersals typically May, June. And then the breeding season comes in the summer. And our staff, we, we kind of like the breeding season because bears aren't focused on food as much. So the nuisance complaints, give, they, they give us a bit of a break in June and July. Uh, and that being said, if you're familiar with the deer rut, which takes place in November. You know, the bulk of the deer breeding is going on in the first two weeks of November. 
And so that's the time of year you see those really big bucks running around that you don't get to see the rest of the year. Well, that time for bears, the bear rut, if you will, um, I find the peak to be right around the 4th of July. So if you're somebody that wants to see a bear in the wild, that's when you should spend your time out there. Um, I was doing field work a couple years ago and saw nine individual bears in one day out in the state forest uh, in Garrett County. Um, you know, the week of 4th, 4th of July week, um, you know, they're just moving around a lot. Um, so in the fall, uh, they will prepare for hibernation, October, November. And then in the winter, they will enter the den. And I'll tell you that they're pretty predictable. Pregnant females will enter the den mid-November, pretty much like clockwork, because they've got a big energy demand coming. Um, you know, in, in growing those cubs, if you will. Now, they go into the den mid-November, uh, typically give birth, to answer a question that was just posed, uh, typically give birth um, mid to late July, uh, January. I'm sorry, mid to late January. By February 1st, the bulk of, of the cubs have been born. Um, and then uh, they come, you know, again, so the so those pregnant females go into the den first mid-November, and then females that have cubs of the year with them, they typically go in about the end of November, first of December, and most other bears are denned up by mid-December. Now it'll fluctuate some based on the amount of natural food that's out there, uh, and potentially some you know with the weather, uh, but it's pretty a pretty reliable calendar there. Now. Note that, again, I said not all bears have to hibernate, and it's typically those adult bears in their prime in really good shape. Um, they, may, they may not go into a den at all. We'll get calls every year in January and February from people who just saw a bear and wonder why there's a bear running around. Um, so, again, bears are intelligent. They've got uh, good memories, and I say this tongue-in-cheek, they're lazy. Um, you know, uh, and uh, you know, so they're going to look for that easy food source. And I'll tell you, you know, it's a, it's a lot easier for them to raid one dumpster than it is to you know get the calories they get out of acorns. Um, you know, you know, eating the comparable am amount of acorns. So you know, a lot with bears is really an energy conservation game. They want to take in as many calories as they can while expending as few as possible. I like to go over some defensive behaviors. Um, bears, you know, some we get a lot of reports of you know, a bear that had an aggressive behavior, and typically that's not the case. Um, you know, they're confusing these defensive behaviors. And bears are good communicators if we can learn to read what they're saying and to understand them. Um, from a very young age, they're taught to climb a tree at the sign of any danger. Uh, so we'll get calls every year. There's a there's a cub in a tree and it's been there, you know, for several hours. What do we do? And the answer is make sure there's a safe escape route for it. So a lot of times there might be a dog at the base or a crowd of people. Clear the crowd. Clear any dogs out of the way. And uh, you know that that sow will come back for that cub. That cub will leave. Um, but it's not unheard of for them to be up in a tree for two days before they leave if they don't feel safe. Um, they will swat at the ground or pop their jaws. And when they swat at the ground, it's a large animated motion, a wide sweeping motion. Again, they're, they're communicating. Um, they pop their jaws. It is loud. Um, I tell people it's like a rattlesnake. If you've never heard one, you know exactly what it wants you to do the first time you hear one. It's the same with a bear popping its jaws at you. When they clash their teeth together, it is loud. They will make a huffing or woofing noise. Um, they'll lower their head, and I say shaking head, but it's really more of a sway side to side. And again, they just want to let you know they're uncomfortable. And eventually they'll do what's called a bluff charge. I've been bluff charged several times uh, over the years, and typically they stop at about 10 feet. Um, I have had... One, I had one in a den bluff charge me as I was entering the den that came within six inches. I could feel it, feel its breath on the back of my neck, um, but it did not make contact. Uh, you know, and I was really in a position where you know who could blame it if it did make contact. 
Um, you know, so they will bluff charge and they will just charge at you and then they will put the brakes on and stop on a dime. Um, you may need a change of pants, but back out and just, just leave the way you came. You know, my advice to people there, when you see a bear, if the bear doesn't see you, enjoy the view. If the bear does see you, know you're there, remain calm, don't stare it down with, you know, direct eye contact, just like a dog. Uh, imagine a stray dog. Um, so you want to stay large, kind of, kind of back out of the area, talk to the bear in a calm voice, and all will be good. Um, one other behavior uh, that we get is the bear stood up. So it, it was aggressive. Well, if you think about that, a bear can run 35 miles an hour on four legs. Why would he handicap himself to two? Um, so, yeah, if it's a bluff charge, the question is, you know, just, just stand there. Yes, you don't ever want to run. Um, bears, like dogs, have a chase reflex. So sometimes they will run. Um, run running out of time, or I'd share a story about a, a turkey hunter that you know, was chased by a bear because he ran. Uh, well, I guess I'm sharing it now. Uh, basically, the bear ran after him for a quarter mile, and, of course, the bear could have, could have caught him at any time. But it was just chasing. It was game on to that bear. Of course, the turkey hunter was scared beyond belief. Um, so, yes, you want to remain still. Again, make yourself large. Uh, and then back away when the bluff charge is over. Um, and and let, the, let the bear know you're backing away. You want to make noise as you're leaving. Uh, I'm going to pass through this part because I'm running out of time. Let's see what we got. So, okay, physical human bear encounters, how to react. Um, always an allow, allow an escape route for the bear. Uh, if the bear is unaware of your presence, back away. And if it's aware of your presence, back away, leave the area while talking to calm voice and make yourself appear large. Um, if the bear should make contact, fight back with anything you have. Um, we have had one documented a uh, case in Maryland where a person was attacked by a bear it happened a few years ago in Frederick County, and it was kind of the perfect storm. It was uh, in November when it was a heavy feeding time, a sow with cubs outside a person's home. Um, the bear was in a tree that was producing a lot of acorns, um, and there were two dogs present. Dogs typically make the situation worse. Um, so if you're going into bear country, you know, a dog is much better on a leash than off. Um, there have been cases documented where a, a dog has spooked a bear and run, and then that chase reflex kicks in. The dog runs back to the owner, of course, and brings the bear with it. Um, so you know, if, if you can't control your dog well enough to call it, stop it, and call it back right away, I really recommend having it on a leash. But again, I, I don't want to leave this with people being afraid. Again, we've had one human bear encounter reported uh, um, in time. So really, I mean, they are remarkable critters. And uh, with that, I, I guess I'll uh, try and get to the, if I can pull up the texts here and see what questions we have. Yeah, Harry, I see a, this is a great presentation. Um, Thank you. See your contact information at the at the end there. You might want to leave that up for for a few minutes. Um, uh, okay. Can I get to the questions here? Yeah. Like yeah. So I the, the well, most of the questions I think you've answered as you went along, um, okay. but I did I did cut, write down a couple that I think uh, you didn't. Um, okay. Um, one was um, are beehives a big attractant? And maybe you okay, did it. Yep. Yeah, yep, I, I think I covered that one. Yes, they are, and uh, so I really highly recommend electric fencing for them. Okay. And it said, um, another question is here, uh, well, are, are do domestic dogs a good deterrent for um, those residences in bear country? Yes and no. Uh, depends on the nature of the dog. If it's a dog that is uh, typically the small, I, guess I will tell you, in the typical instance, the smallest dog can chase the biggest bear away. Um, I once had one of my house cats tree a bear, um, you know, if you can believe that one. It was a 200-pound bear treed by a house cat. Um, but 
again, if it's a if it's a dog whose nature is, I will tell you, if it's shepherd of some sort and its nature is to attack a threat, then that's not good because likely the you know the dog is going to get hurt. Um, so uh, so dogs, yes, just the just having them there and barking, making noise, laying down, uh, you know, scent everywhere is a good deterrent, but try not to let them chase the bear. I noticed uh, Ryan asked about the, uh, there we go. Um, Ryan asked, it's July that we do our scent station survey. Um, mid to late July is, is when we conduct that. Saw so that question come up. Uh, what else did we have? Another question I see here is, uh, how do bears eat acorns? Um, well, I'll tell you, I mean, they will just, basically, they will work the forest floor like a vacuum cleaner. And they will also climb up into the trees and uh, break branches off and eat them just one at a time um, off the branches. So in the years where, uh, and they prefer white oak acorns over red oak acorns, just like deer. Um, in years where there's an abundant white oak acorn crop, you will see claw marks going up and down the, the oak trees like crazy. Um, you know, when you walk in and, and uh, you know, you'll, you'll definitely see. Okay. Um, I just saw a question about hunting them. The hunting season is in October. Um, it's a lottery draw because it's a limited number of hunters allowed. Um, you know, we, we usually have more interest than what we have permits available. Uh, and the lottery is always available in August. You can go to the DNR's website in August and enter the lottery. It's a $15 application fee for the lottery but there's no additional license to buy if you get drawn other than your regular hunting license. And also, um, uh, and also if you're not drawn this year, you'll get an extra entry in next year's lottery if you, if you uh, continue to apply. And I, I see somebody asked about, are we, are we trapping bears out of counties? No, we are not. Um, we've found over time that, Trapping bears and moving them is not really effective on the Maryland landscape. Uh, and as far as the bears traveling through our more suburban areas, um, we usually find it's safer for both the bears and the people if we let them move along on their own. They found their way in. They can find their way out. Um, when we go in and use drugs to do it, uh, you know, we can dart a bear in a tree, but it typically takes 15 or 20 minutes for the drug to take effect. Uh, and then, you know, basically um, the, the drugs we use are counteracted by adrenaline. Uh, it gives a, a, a lot of time for the bear to make a bad decision, like run into traffic. What I, see, um, I see another question. Any idea of population by county? Okay, by uh, county, no. Um, we don't have a population estimate at that fine scale. Right now, we have about 2,250 adults, so totally excludes cubs, uh, or uh, about 2,250 adults across the four western counties. And it's not an even split. There are more in Allegheny Garrett than there are in Washington Frederick. Um, but um, unfortunately, that, that's as good as I can get you right now. Well, this is obviously, question is obviously from a person in Frederick County. Where is the densest population of bears in Frederick County? <laughs> up by Gambrel. <laughs> uh, yeah. Up by Gambrel, hands down. I mean, that, that is uh, just as dense a population as anywhere in Garrett County, pretty much. Um, there were a couple questions here. Um, people are asking, was it possible to get a copy of the PowerPoint? Um, and I'm not sure this we, if, if you if you want, we could you know you post a copy of a PDF of it. Um, if, if you if you wanted to do that, but otherwise it's in the the presentation. But, yeah, you'll have it in your presentation there, right? Yes. We'll we'll stick with that just just because there's a lot of information that can be misinterpreted. Um, okay. Um, that's fine. Do you provide written materials in Spanish? Is a question. Um, uh, well, unfortunately, uh, this is um, in English. Although I will say that we're looking at uh, uh, PowerPoint. We are. There are some types of PowerPoint where you can actually do that. Okay. But uh, that, we don't have that right now. That's good to know because there there are people at the department working on the same thing. We want to make more more available in Spanish. 
um, but I'm, I've not been involved in those talks. So um, I guess if there's an individual, you know, get in touch with me and I'll, I'll see what I can do. Uh, do you need use or need volunteers? Um, not typically, especially these days with social distancing. Um, you know, uh, you know, I would love to be able to share this with everybody, but uh, just concerns for safety for both people and, and bears. I, I will say one of the highlights was I I worked up in New York uh, back in the mid '80s. <laughs> And going out with the going out with the, I think it was then Pennsylvania down in Pennsylvania going out with, with their uh, with Gary Alt. It, it was before Gary Alt, I think maybe even I'm not sure. Okay. Actually, uh, and basically going and, and uncovering some dens and helping. I still have pictures of us holding up the little cubs and things like right. that. <laughs> okay. It's other than observation, other than observations, wonderful way to spend a day. <laughs> yeah, it was great. <laughs> Other than observations from the public and telemetry, does DNR do any surveillance to confirm or establish breeding range? Um, typically, well, yes, we, we do telemetry, you know, our telemetry work. If we get enough, uh, I, I guess, good, uh, good enough information from the public, then we will look at it. We will look into an area further. Um, we can actually try and try and trap or use trail cameras, uh, you know. Then so um, so limited, but you know we we are limited on staff and manpower resources. And and this is a follow up to the presentation. Now, this presentation is being recorded. We will edit out some of the troublesome stuff at the beginning, which we apologize for. Um, and they'll be posting the recording on our YouTube channel uh, next week on our website at extension.umd.edu slash woodland. Okay. Um, I do not have any more. If anybody has any more questions, I'd please uh, encourage you to put them in the chat box. Um, thanks, everybody, from me. Thank you for taking time to uh, to tune in today. Just uh, give one more minute. Um, most of the comments I say are uh, very helpful. And again, um, I guess I guess that will be okay. Hold on here. How about Southern Catoctin Mountain, Frederick County, five miles from Potomac? We have had two visits lately on the ridge. Looks like a teenager, and we have called you guys and are doing the recommendations on trash protection. So that's. Great, I'm glad they're doing that. Yeah, again, it's a peak movement time, and really they, they've started to move in, I'd say, over the last three or four years in that southern part of the county. Um, so we're seeing more, uh, but it sounds to me like a dispersing male more than likely right now. And I see another one here. When you see a bear in Anne Arundel County, where did it go? Or maybe... Um, it, usually it it'll, it, it's ended up, in, that's a dispersing bear that's moving. It'll continue to move. Uh, so it may end up in Pennsylvania, may end up, uh, you know, down in Virginia somewhere. It's, it's hard to tell. Another question, does handling the cubs have a negative effect for the bears? Uh, no, no. Again, we've been doing this since the mid-80s, and now I wouldn't, there's a, there's a window of time there where I believe that would change greatly once the bears are out of the den. But while the sow is denned, um, no, it doesn't doesn't seem to cause any problems. And I saw where somebody asked, "Do they swim the Potomac?" Yes, they absolutely do. <laughs> they do um, backstroke, or <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, have you seen a bear swimming across the? I've seen them swim across Deep Creek Lake several times. Um, okay. And yeah, we had one a few years ago, unfortunately showed up as a roadkill at the southern tip of St. Mary's County. Um, mm -hmm. We had no other sightings, and I'm sure it swam across the Potomac from Virginia and then got hit in St. Mary's County. Someone commented, that's that's the bear paddle instead of a dog paddle. So. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, I, um, again... Any other last minute questions? Uh, I see a lot of thank yous and uh, appreciation. And I'm, uh, um, any in Rock Creek Park? 
Um, there usually we have them pass through there just about each year. Uh, so sometime during May and June this year, I'm sure one will pass through, but but they're they're not there year round. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we'll we'll stop it there. It's about ten after one, and uh, you know, Harry, thank you, thank you very much, and we'll get this posted. And yeah. uh, what I usually find, we had you know about seventy seventy one people on this session. Uh, we had a, over a hundred registered, which is uh, kind of a, the way it goes. But I think you'll find that once we put it out there, that a whole lot of more people will 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 view it as a recording. So, Great. And uh, I would caution, ask everyone to. Uh, we'll be sending out a follow up to you, and again, uh, if you with a message about putting you on our mailing list, you know, for our forestry newsletter. And so you get, you know, more upcoming events. Uh, we plan on another uh, of these programs the last Wednesday of, uh, of June as, as, as well. And we'll be coming out with more information on that. And we plan to do those uh, for, for a number of months. So thank you very much. And uh, everybody have a great day. You too. All right. Thanks, Harry.